Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Jeanette Reyes. We are live from Georgetown University's historic Gaston Hall, bringing you the only televised debate in the 2022 Democratic primary for mayor of the District of Columbia. Over the next hour, our candidates will be asked a series of questions. Each candidate will have one minute to respond, followed by two and a half minutes for discussion. Alongside me, moderating tonight is the executive director of Georgetown Institute's of politics, Mo Alethi, and Fox 5 on the Hill anchor, Tom Fitzgerald, who will be introducing the candidates right now. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. It is time to meet our candidates this evening. Muriel Bowser is the mayor of the District of Columbia. She represented Ward 4 on the D.C. Council from 2007 to 2015. In 2015, she was sworn in as mayor and four years later re-elected. Mayor Bowser is running for a third consecutive term. Trayon Watt is a D.C. council member representing Ward 8. He was first elected to the council in 2016. He was re-elected to a second term in 2020. This is the council member first campaign for mayor of the District of Columbia. And Robert White is also a D.C. council member. In 2016, he was first elected as an at-large council member. He was re-elected to that office in 2020. This is council member Robert White's first campaign for mayor of the District of Columbia. So. Let's get started. Mo has our first question today. Thanks, Mitch. Mayor, Mayor Bowser, council members, thank you for being here. Welcome to Georgetown. Let's jump right in with an issue that's top of mind for many district voters, public safety, a growing concern. As violent crime rates, according to data posted to the district website just today, are up 17 percent compared to this date last year. Now, Mayor Bowser has said that she wants to increase the police force to 4,000 officers. Is adding more officers the answer to our violent crime problem in the district? Each of you will have a minute to answer, and let's start with you, Mayor Bowser. Thank you, Mo, and I want to thank everybody at, here at Georgetown and Fox 5 for the invitation. Uh, and certainly, I want to make it very clear. I've heard loud and clear from D.C. residents, and I share the concern as well. Uh, violent crime and addressing violent crime is on the top of my mind every single day. I wake up in the morning, think about it. I go to bed uh, thinking about it. And all of us are going to tell you about our comprehensive plans to address it. So no one who's smart will say that there's only one solution. Uh, and that's why we have addressed violent crime and throughout my entire tenure by making sure we put every resource available at our disposal to fighting violent crime and working with our public safety partners to do the same. But I'm going to be the only one willing to tell you that I'm going to make the tough calls when it comes to violent crime, including making sure we have the police that we need. Uh, we have faced two years of defunding our police force. I have advanced a bold plan to make sure we get there, focusing on hiring D.C. residents and hiring women, meeting Chief Conchi's pledge of getting to 30 percent women in our force by 2030. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Trayon White. Thank you. We are in a public safety crisis, and you must know uh, that we have consistently ignored crime in D.C. with the narrative that crime is down. And we know that you can't address a solution without first addressing the problem. As the council member, I was the first member on the council to get money in the budget for violence prevention. When I got to the council, the budget for violence prevention was zero dollars because that's lack of vision. Now we're at a 20-year high. Bad things happen when good people do nothing. I created a 33-document plan and presented it to the council and got money in the budget. And now we're at a place right now, we are in critical mass. It's just not east of the river, it's across the city because of the lack of leadership. Everything rises and falls on leadership. So my plan is not just to uh, increase the police, but create wraparound services, uh, create better housing, uh, mental health services, substance abuse, and wraparound services to address the whole community, not just locking people up. We need the police, but police is not the end-all solution to addressing crime in Washington, D.C. And I say that because in the, in the height of the, of the crack epidemic, we had over 5,000 officers and was indeed the, the murder capital of Washington, D.C. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Robert White. <laughs> Council Member Robert White. Uh, thank you for the question. People across our city are afraid in every part of our city. And that is because as violent crime has gone up for the past six years, our mayor still has no plan, and that is not fair to the residents we serve. 
The mayor has told you that she has a plan, but throwing money at everything is not a plan. I've developed a comprehensive public safety plan that I'm ready to implement on day one. It's going to keep us safe now and 10 years from now. We are going to focus police resources on public safety, not use our police as a catch-all agency. We need them responding to crime, patrolling, and solving cases. I'm going to expand and coordinate our violence intervention programs to meet the need of the problem, because if our goal is to keep people safe, we have got to prevent more crimes. But I'm also going to get support to survivors of crime, because I've been to too many funerals of young people, watching other young people shed tears, and those tears are turning into hardened trauma, and that is going to replicate crime if we don't get them the resources that they need before they turn to acts of violence. So what we need is a real public safety plan. That's what I'm ready to implement. Thank you. Day one. Thank you, Councilmember Wright. All right. Now it gets interesting. We're going to move into the open discussion period. For the next two and a half minutes, we're going to fade into the background a little bit and let the three of you continue the conversation on public safety. And let me toss it back to you, Mayor, to begin, because they both pointed some criticism at you and your administration on this issue. So I'll give you a chance to respond and then let the three of you take the conversation from there. Well, you'll hear a lot of pointing the fingers and criticism to me. Uh, and we know that both gentlemen uh, have been on the council for six years and have had every opportunity to work on public safety and public safety issues. Uh, we know what they chose to do was serve an ideology and not the residents of the District of Columbia in making sure that we have the police officers that we need. I am proud that in my administration Administration, I stood up a violence prevention agency. We started small and we have grown to every part of the city, making sure that we have people from the neighborhood who know the issues to connect people uh, to the services that we have. Wrap wraparound services, connecting to victims to services, we do that already. And we do a lot of it all across the city. What we have worked on now over the last year is making sure we can identify a framework to identify people who have used guns, who are likely to use guns again, or to be victims of violent crime and connect them to services. We know that there are 200. We think that we could serve up to 500 a year. When we pour into that 200 to 500 people a year, relatively small group, we know that we can help their families and, and their associates. Members, why you look like yeah, I want to correct some things. The reason the council put a violence intervention program in the office of the attorney general is because the mayor wouldn't move. And so she was a roadblock to violence intervention. I'm glad she eventually came along, but not all the way, and we need her to go further. Uh, when, we, when, when the mayor talks about about defunding the police, that's a dog whistle. It is a shame that in the District of Columbia, we cannot find a way to stand up and say to our communities that we can protect you with things more than police. Our communities need police to keep us safe, but they deserve more than just police. That is what my comprehensive public safety plan gives us. That All is right. what we have not gotten from our current mayor. Two and a half minutes goes fast. Can I add to that before you skip, skip that? And so I uh, hear uh, both of these two saying that the council did and the mayor did, but I was present. I was present at the, at the hearings prior to becoming a council member. And Councilman McDuffie uh, issued, uh, introduced the NIR Act, which was not fully funded, that had violence interrupters in the plan. And so when the mayor said she did that, she waited three years to implement, fully implement that plan. Council Only, member, in order to keep us running on time here, yeah. we are going to need to, to, to commit well, to our, uh, to same our time form here. Got this, I have a question for you. Yep. Uh, Council Member White, last calendar year, there were 420 carjackings mm -hmm. in the District of Columbia. Just 150 arrests. Two thirds of those were juveniles. This is an issue that is making people scared to stop at red lights or to put gas in their car at night right now. What do you think the root cause of this crime is, and what would you do to stop it as mayor? Well, I'm a young man growing up in this in this area um, who is considered an anomaly. Uh, most people look like me to come from where I come from, don't make it to become a council member. Partly because there's been a divestment in youth and young adult services in D.C. When I say that, I think about all red clothes, catching red clothes, Kramer red clothes, and the red clothes, blue red clothes, number 11 boys and girls club clothes, and that's just in Ward 8. 
And so we can't say we care about the youth and young adults and divesting in the services. You hear parents saying, I want a mentor for my child. I want somewhere for my child to go after school. When we don't build something constructive for them to do, it leads them to do stuff destructive. And so under my leadership, my job is to put our money where our mouth is and invest in our young people so they can have a, a brighter future right here in our city. Councilmember White. Question is carjacking. What can you do to stop this? For, for most of my youth, uh, I was a failing student who was counted out like a lot of the young people that we are seeing spiraling in our city. They are spiraling because our schools are not strong enough for children of color. 60% of black and brown students are behind grade level, and that is one of the causes. One of the other causes is that we are not treating the mental health, the trauma that these young people are experiencing. We keep pointing at them and saying, you young people have failed us. The reality is that we have failed these young people, not giving them the out of school time programs they need, not giving them the mental health support that they need. We have to do better for these young people, and they will do better in return. We have to hold them accountable when they make mistakes, but if we're doing our job, we're preventing them from making those mistakes. So I, I'm, I'm going to say something a little different than my colleagues here, um, because if anybody promises you that the government can do it all, uh, they are woefully mistaken. Uh, what we know is that strong kids, healthy kids, come from strong families and healthy families, and how we pour into families matters. That's why it matters that we're investing in affordable housing, that we're investing in quality health care, and that we're doing it across all eight wards. It also matters that we're investing in our schools and why we can't turn back the clock on our schools and school reforms. The truth is, in the last 15 years, people have come back to our public schools. We have made our teachers the best paid and the best trained in the region. Uh, we have added pre-K-3 and early childhood education, and we have put quality adults in those schools. And I am not willing to turn back. The truth is, we have to very much focus on our young people. This pandemic has upended their lives. They're coming back into school, um, finding it very hard to acclimate, and not only are they having in problems in schools, but they're having uh, and creating serious open. problems in the neighborhood. Let's continue. Yeah, so I, I want to add to that. Let's, let's continue. So I, I want to remind you, open discussion is open discussion for you. Okay. So all three of you, I discuss with each that. other what's different about your proposals. You so, all seem to have the same goal, but different ways of getting it. Well, the reality is that we're here, here to investment in affordable housing, right? Um, but we have not seen a return on that investment. We spent almost a billion dollars in the last 10 years on affordable housing. Yet each and every day, I'm getting calls in my office saying, uh, I can't find anywhere to live, and we're getting priced out, or we haven't gotten an inspection yet, or we, we are stuck outside, we need somebody to come pick us up. The reality is, for brown and black people in the city, we haven't felt that investment. And we've seen 20,000 black people leave this city in the last 10 years because that investment has become a slush fund for developers. So let me, let me say this. When it comes to young people, when it comes to young people, the mayor said we can't do it all. But when development wants to happen, we always got the time and resources. At some point, we have got to have the time and resources for young people in our city. When the mayor says people are coming back to our schools, no, we have displaced students from our schools. They are being replaced with others. When the mayor says we are paying our teachers more, yes, we are, but we're losing 20% of our teachers every year to go somewhere else and make less money. So we have fundamental problems in our city that are affecting our young people who need us to step up for them. So I think it, what, what is very important, so we can, we can talk about problems in, in our schools and in our families, but it, and I, I will have to repeat that we have to work together as a community, family, church, neighborhoods to focus on the problems that we are facing um, with our young people and they're very, very serious problems. We have made very significant investments in parks and recreation. Uh, we were the first, in fact, in the region to bring our parks and recreation back up last summer, the first in the region to have in-person learning for our schools, to make sure that our kids were connected uh, to services. That is the way um, that we are going to make changes. We're going to bring them back in our buildings. We've added 3,000 kids uh, in our middle school grades, uh, and we had nine straight years of growth in our schools, only impacted on the last year by COVID. Yeah. 
before I ask my next question, I just want to remind the audience about the ground rules. I, I know you're passionate about the issues and you're passionate about your candidates, but if we can keep those to a minimum so that they can answer the question and folks in will hear the answer to the question. Uh, Council Member Robert White. The debate over school resource officers in schools has been a hot button issue. The council voted to phase out SROs that Mayor Bowser proposed keeping them for the upcoming year. What is your position on keeping SROs in schools? Um, look, we, the council voted to take uh, school resource officers, police officers out of schools at the request of students who came to the council and said their schools felt like prisons. But I was also a troubled young man, and I am so lucky that the people who helped me and corrected me were teachers and not police officers, because my path would have been very different. Now, we have to continue to stand up for these young people who have made this request to us. We have an obligation to keep our young people safe. That doesn't mean that we need more armed police officers. We can have security guards without having traditional police officers. But we have a school system where there are more officers than there are guidance counselors and social workers, and that is the root of the problem. So we can't run away from the root of the problem. We have got to get right to it. If we want our young people to do better, to be safer, then we have to address their mental health. We can't keep bringing in people with guns and saying that's the way to keep our kids safe. All right, Council Member, your time is up. <laughs> Council Member, pray on white. You have one minute. So for those who may not know me, I started this work as a youth football coach. Um, and I really got entrenched by going beyond a football coach to a life coach because in 2004, between 2004 and 2006, I lost five young men to homicide that were all under the age of 17. One was James Richardson, who got killed in Blue Senior High School. What I know is, is historically, our schools and around our schools have become more violent. While police is not the end-all solution to addressing crime, what I also realize is that our school, school security is not authorized to break up fights. That creates a double-edged sword. So if the police is not there, and no one's there to break up fights. Fights escalate and become more violent. That means our students are more in jeopardy of getting hurt. I got a call about a month ago from a parent. She said, Mr. White, can you come up to school? I'm trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, she said, there's a group of parents waiting at the school trying to fight the parents and ask me, who am I there for to try to jump me? This is the climate we're living in today. You see all around the world with the mag shootings happening among students and young adults. And so it's imperative that we keep our students safe. With we'll wraparound services, violence interventions, police officers, and counselors inside of our schools. All right, Mayor, uh, you have one minute. Uh, I, I think we've heard some concerns uh, about our, our teachers and our teachers staying in our system, our principals and our principals staying in our system. Uh, and these are worthy concerns because they have had a heck of a last two years. Um, they pivoted during COVID, they taught vir in virtual school, and now they're back in classrooms dealing with kids who are having trouble acclimating to being back in school. And the behavioral issues have been significant and some of them have risen to the level that the council member just described where parents are involved. Now is not the time. Now I'll tell you, the, I told this to the council last year when they put it in place without a hearing and they did it in the budget and I raised it again this year. This is not the time to be removing uh, officers that the children and administrators know. So here's the deal. We're not going to eliminate having police in schools. What you will eliminate is having police in schools that the children know and that the administrators know. And in fact, you're going to do the opposite of what you claim to do. You will have more arrests if you have uh, officers that don't know the kids and can de-escalate situations. Mayor Rousey, your time is up. You have your two and a half minutes. We're, we're returning to a very familiar false dichotomy, which is, you know, we all care uh, about the school to prison pipeline. We all care about mass incarceration of people of color. We all believe that black lives matter. But when it is time to address the policies that lead to these problems, people want to move in high and say now is not the time. Well, it's never going to be the right time to do the right thing. Now is the time that we start doing the right thing. And also follow the logic here. They're saying that our schools are unsafe. Right now, SROs are in schools. So logically, how is that the right answer if it's not working now? Fundamentally, what we are saying is we need to do something different. Does anybody want to respond to that? Say so in my campaign, I've hired uh, approximately 100 youth uh, in our campaign. And when you hear them speak, uh, the number one issue that they're facing in traveling on the subway, on the bus to get to school, is safety. And it's imperative as leaders, we make sure we put the preventive measures in place, not only keep them safe, but their families safe. 
We know that 40% of youth traveling um, from east of the river have to travel across the river because we don't have quality seats uh, in, our, in, in all our schools. And so we have to be logical in trying to uh, make sure we have adequate solutions to the problem. And it's not just about uh, police, but it's about restorative justice. It's about peer-to-peer -peer mentoring. It's about youth being active in their uh, social engagement to decrease their own violence. The greatest influence on a, on a young person is another young person. And our job is to empower the young people to decrease violence in their schools. And that's how equal is important. We're almost out of time, Mayor. I see you nodding your head. You like no, I, I would add, and that's why it's been so important for us to stand up safe passage programs, which we've done, put credible messengers in our schools, uh, which we have also done, but also make sure that the administrators have spoken up, principals um, who have the responsibility, and that's a huge responsibility. When we, we send our children into a building, um, that principal is responsible for them getting home to us safely. Uh, and they have asked to make sure that we're not only adding school nurses and mental health providers, which we are doing, um, but that, that they also have the appropriate security personnel. Okay, our time is up. Council Member Trayon White, we're going to start with you on this next question. We're going to stay in, this, in the space of education. The pandemic really put a spotlight on areas of disparity. Um, and amplified them in many cases. Uh, and that's very clear in educational disparities between the district's white students and their black and brown counterparts. So my question is, how do you plan on making better use of funding and the district's budget to narrow that gap? Let me say this. I believe it was 2019 while on the council. I received a budget in which 15 Ward A schools were underfunded. Uh, you know, we used a student per pupil ratio to pay the schools. And these schools uh, had almost the same amount of youth as they had before. And so we were trying to figure out what was going on. We talk about equity in this city. It has to go across the board, across the city. There's been a, a strategic divestment in youth. And this happened way before the pandemic, right? The pandemic highlighted what's happening throughout the city. Um, and so we must not just think that the pandemic uh, exacerbated it, but it show that we are saying that we are the fastest growing education system in the country, where the reality is we're far behind. Over 30, over 70 percent of our youth in our, in our school systems are not proficient on math and reading, and that's criminal. Councilmember Robert White. Uh, we spend $2 billion a year on public education in the city, and as the father of two young black girls, I refuse to accept that it is okay that 60% of black and brown students are behind grade level, that is not good enough. So here's what I'm gonna do differently. I'm gonna move with a sense of urgency and anybody in our education system who doesn't have a sense of urgency has to go. We're going to keep our teachers by respecting them, replacing the flawed impact teacher evaluation system with one that respects our teachers and keeps the good ones in our classroom. We are going to try new things. We're going to do a massive expansion of trade and vocational education so that students who don't plan to go to college don't fall through the cracks. And we're going to try new things like pilot a public boarding school option for the parents who say, I work odd hours and I'm not home in the evening, my child needs supports, or to support the students like the Washington Met students who school, the mayor closed over their impassioned uh, objections who say we need a different type of environment. We're going to understand that there's no one size fits Thank all you. education. We're going to catch every Thank single you, student. Member. Mayor Bowser. So I think you talked about how we're closing equity gaps and we are, uh, it is an imperative that a city as prosperous as ours does exactly that. Uh, we have used our per pupil funding formula to do that by focusing the at-risk formula so that the dollars follow the students who need them. Um, the chancellor just this year, we worked the formula so that we know for sure that at-risk dollars are going uh, exactly where they're supposed to be. Uh, we are and we have encouraged uh, many schools in our district to use at-risk weight uh, during the lottery and we created uh, early childhood centers at Stevens and Military Road schools that are citywide early child care uh, schools uh, with an at-risk weight. So we know that when we provide opportunities in neighborhoods and citywide, we can do exactly that. We also created a new banner 
Baker High School in the center of the city, where we made it larger um, so that there are more citywide opportunities, and we proposed the same in Ward 3. Thank you, Mayor. Let's move into the discussion. Yeah. I, I want to correct something. The, the mayor is talking about at-risk funds. The mayor has been in office for seven and a half years, and those at-risk funds have yet to get to the students that need them. That's and everybody in the city knows that. Schools are using the money that the law says must get to the students at risk of academic failure. The law says it must get to those students. It does not consistently. Schools are using it to cover basic gaps, basic teacher positions, because we have underfunded public education. And when you underfund that public education, there is no doubt that our students are not going to do well. And I say this, there is no equity in our city unless there is education equity. One thing we have not done. Let the mayor respond to that and then <laughs> council member. One thing we have not done in this city, thanks to our taxpayers, is underfund education. Since 2007, when we have embarked on school reform, we have put over $10 billion in our school buildings. We have invested in our teachers with a competitive um, t pay scale in training. Uh, we have made sure that we have capable adults providing mental health and counseling. We have done all of those things in our schools. And the reason why our taxpayers trust us to do it is because we have mayoral accountability and council oversight. And what my colleagues here uh, have said is they're going to back away from that. They're going to turn the clock back 15 years. And so what I fear that we could be doing in a, count, in a white administration uh, is talking about which boxes are where instead of how we invest in our kids. And that's what we are going to do. Are we going to say things that are blatantly untrue? And just another reminder to our very passionate audience, we want to make sure that they get a chance to speak as well. So let me correct something. Since 2007, under the Fenty administration and under the Gray administration, we closed down over 42 schools in the name of consolidation. To date, we have not seen more dollars in schools. In fact, classrooms are busting at the seams. And D.C. has become a place where they're teaching the kids how to pass the test. And those who do, who do well go on to do well. And those who don't get stuck in the, in the cracks. And so we have to realize that students are a whole people. Move on. And we have to ensure that we are educating our, the whole child. And we're not. We're and so gonna, we're not, we're can't keep saying 2007 now. because I'm gonna 2007. I'm going to violate Moe's rule and interrupt. <laughs> but let me finish my thought, though. Every time I talk, you cut me off, man. Come on, man. We're over time. Well, I at least got to close my statement. That's, that's, Mayor Bowser, that's I want to talk to you about housing. It's a critical issue. Yep. It's no secret that affordable housing has been a long problem in D.C., a problem that has been made worse by this pandemic. So, Mayor, what have you done on affordable housing, and what will you do if elected to a third consecutive term to improve this problem for the people who are struggling to find housing they can pay for. Well, what we have done is, is focus on uh, making sure that we have a plan across the entire city. I made it a hallmark of my tenure in office, starting as an ANC commissioner, a council member, and now mayor, to create affordable housing. D.C. and affordability didn't become just become a problem when I became mayor. We're a dynamic city. We attract a lot of people. We attract a lot of businesses. And therefore, it's more expensive to live here. I made a pledge to put $100 million in every single year. We've been $400 million in the last two years, $500 million for the next year, which will get us 36,000 units. I am the only mayor across the country who has made the type of investments that we've made in our housing production trust fund. The only mayor... In this region, I have to say, the only mayor in this region to set a goal. We've challenged all of the DMV to match our goal. 36,000 units. Mayor, I'm going to be a bad guy and cut you okay. off. And because I cut off Council Member you Trey, got it. just a minute ago, we'll start with you. And so we have to rethink uh, how we are spending money in the Housing Production Trust Fund. As a council member, I had to rewrite the law because Kathy Patterson, who was our auditor, said that the government was breaking the law and how we spent that money. It's facts. 
And so what we have to do is rethink how we're spending that money. There are a, a lot of dilapidated properties in D.C. that we can rehab. D.C. has a plethora of vacant and blighted properties in our own portfolio. We have to invest in those houses, build them up, and get people in those houses. Because we know when we don't do that, when we don't do that, we exacerbate the homelessness and the hopelessness here in Washington, D.C. So as mayor, that's... That's on the priority list to make sure we are getting people into quality living situations to make sure they have access to health care and make sure they have access to a quality education, which has not happened in eight years and $120 billion later. Yeah. Councilman Robert White. Thank you. Uh, your, your question you asked was, 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 was what, what the mayor has done to address affordable housing. She said she spent a lot of money. Look, if you ask me how I fix the hole in my roof and I say I spent a lot of money, guess what? I probably still got a hole in my roof. So we have spent a lot of money, but people have not seen the value. Because what the mayor characterizes as affordable housing is focused on people who make more than the average, the median black family income for black families. That's why we're seeing displacement. What I'm going to do as mayor is I'm going to stand up to developers and say, if you want to be a part of our community, you have to build the housing we need. We need housing for the CVS clerk that makes $35,000, housing for our government workers that make fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000. We have to take a different approach to how we develop uh, housing on public lands using ideas like community land trust and social housing. And most importantly, we have to protect our existing housing because people in the city are living in deplorable conditions because Mayor Bowser's administration is not enforcing bad housing conditions. So let me, let me ask my, I thought it was yeah. discussion. I want to move on to the mayor here. So okay. I, I think what you heard is we don't need money for affordable housing. Nobody heard so that. So all Nobody of these heard that. things that Nobody they say that. they're going to do, hold Nobody it, hold that. it, hold it. Nobody heard that. Hold it. Nobody so what, what I'm telling you is what I've done because it takes money to do it. So if somebody is telling you that they're going to build housing and they're not going to have developers and they're not going to put public Nobody monies, they're not Nobody going to build that. any housing. So that is the truth. You can look at my record, it's replete. I have, I have, from ANC commissioner to council member to now, I just left an affordable housing development in Ward 4, where we created 88 units for seniors. Where I just left an affordable housing unit in Congress Heights. I got to be able to speak. Again. So I'm, I'm baffled at what, the, what the I gotta, mayor is I'm sorry, I got to be able to speak. We got to let our candidates speak. So once again, we ask you in the audience so that our candidates can speak and our audience at home can hear as well. Thank okay, you. So, so my point is this. I have a record of building affordable housing and supporting quality development in all eight wards. And I'm the only one who can say that. And, and so let me just speak clearly. Uh, when residents call my office or anyone's office trying to get housing, we have to call the Department of Human Services. One lady called the office and said, Mr. White, uh, I'm trying to get housing. Can you help me? Because when I went to Virginia Williams, they told, they asked me, where was I sleeping? And if I told them I was sleeping in the hallway, they would call CFSA to, to call all my children because my children aren't in the hallway. We created more barriers to housing under this administration than two administrations combined. The laws has changed. And so if we are saying we are going to create housing for all and uh, pathway to the middle class, let's really do that because it has not happened. We, and I have a plan to we, fix it, to, re, to create equity in housing. All that, across, I, when I, real quick, when I hear the council member talk about uh, the community land trust, the community land trust is in Ward 8 right now called the Douglas Community Land Trust. You don't believe me? Look it up. It's not about talking to talk, but it's about walking to walk. Because everyday people in D.C. are not feeling the, the, the pressures. Uh, We've not feeling time uh, on this segment. So every time. <laughs> If it makes you feel better. I didn't get to rebut that one. You gotta get a clock or something. I, I didn't man. get any time on that it's one, crazy. Council Member. If it makes you feel better. Let's start with you then, Council Member Robert White. It's uh, time. Vacancy rates, including uh, office vacancy rates, are high in the district post-pandemic, and even as we're on the tail end of the pandemic, really. Many people are also working from home. As mayor, what will you do to bring businesses uh, and workers back into DC? 
Uh, since I got to the council, I've been forward thinking. Before the pandemic, the vacancy rate downtown in commercial buildings was 14%. That is why five years ago, I started pushing the mayor to convert older office buildings into workforce and affordable housing so that we could create 24-hour life downtown. The mayor pushed off the idea, shelled it, said, no, it's a ridiculous idea. Now we are saying, oh, that's a good idea. We should do it. But we're five years behind. We should have been doing this five years ago. We also have to understand that, as you said in the question, most people don't have to work from the office anymore. So what we want to do is make sure that our downtown is attractive to people who are working virtually. Just because they're working virtually doesn't mean they're working at home. We can have a vibrant downtown, but we have to first understand that it is not going to look the way it did before the pandemic. Councilmember Trayon White, I want to give you an opportunity to respond. You have oh. one minute. So to, to that end, I was trying to explain before this invisible clock came up three times. <laughs> um, that it's about putting our money where our mouth is, right? Uh, we talked about uh, the Douglas Community Land Trust also have a bill pending, waiting to get funded by the mayor for the, for you, the fourth year. You got the year, budget. You got the called, budget. Called uh, displacement free zones, where we freeze the taxes around our areas hardest hit by development. Because you know we built 14th Street, U Street, 8th Street, all across the district. Those residents and businesses who, who were originally there are no longer there anymore. We're socially engineering gentrification under this administration. And so my... My plan is about responsible development. We also have a plan to get more people into home ownership. We have an 81% wealth gap between blacks and whites in D.C. because we don't own our own businesses and we don't own our own homes in our community. And that has to change. That's going to change now under, under the new leadership of Trayon White for mayor. So don't just stand there. Do something. Mayor Bowser, Mayor Bowser, we'll give you one minute to respond. What was the question? I'm sorry. Uh, vacancy rates are high in the district post-pandemic. Many people are also working from home. As mayor, what have you done and what will you do to continue to bring businesses and workers sure. back? Sure. So, so thanks for that question. And I, I have to, I've heard a couple of times the mayor didn't fund something. Uh, just a little primer on how our budget works. The mayor proposes the budget and the council approves the budget. So between the two of them, they have been, they have six budgets that they have could have funded any and all of their priorities in $19.5 billion. Are the initiatives that I propose and want to get done, get funded, get through, and get implemented. So let me talk about bringing back the downtown, because really that's what this election is about. It's about D.C.'s comeback, and who do you trust to lead it? Uh, and the fact is... I have led this city through a lot, especially in the last two years. I keep my promises, I do what I say I'm going to do, and I don't waffle. And so what we are going to do is we are going to continue to work with the business community to fill the spaces that are vacant, to attract new employers, to work with the council on the economic development tools that we need to do that. We are going okay, to attract housing, and we have a real plan to do it in the downtown and Mayor bring Bowser, people, tourists, festival goers, conventioners time is to up. the downtown. All right, you know the drill. Open discussion. Robert White, Councilmember Robert White, do you want to respond? Uh -huh. I, I just want to clarify, in case the mayor didn't understand, the, the, office, mayor to, understands the well. office to residential conversion. I'm sorry, she does understand. She just continues to mischaracterize deliberately. So what the mayor mischaracterized is that I did fund the office to residential conversion. It was the plan that they decided to shelve. But that is why we need a forward-thinking mayor, not a reactive mayor. What we have had for the past eight years is a reactive mayor. This time calls for somebody who is going to connect the dots in a way that has not happened in the past eight years. Understanding that this is an opportunity for folks who have been left behind, an opportunity to do downtown in a way that it hasn't done before, been done before, but it is going to require somebody who's bold enough to try new things, and we are not seeing any new ideas come out no, of this council member, I, may, I, may, no, I do want to give Councilmember Treon White an opportunity to respond. What would you like to say? Yes, I just want to say we are the nation's capital, and every time we go to Vegas to these conferences, uh, there are businesses thriving and eager to come to the city. What we have to do is incentivize them to stay here because we know that we empower businesses, they hire from the community. I, I was the one that created what is now called the Dream Grant and DSLBD to give uh, government dollars to local small businesses to stay in business prior to the pandemic. And so if we want our businesses to stay and thrive here and build more businesses in our vacant and blighted properties downtown, we have to have a strategic investment to make it work. We have all these studies going on every year. We're paying for these studies, but there's no implementation.
Okay, that is our time, Council Member Trown White. Thank you. All right, Mayor Bowser. Whether we're talking about the problem of homelessness or whether we're talking about the challenges in our school communities, one other thing the pandemic showed us are the significant gaps in mental health services. Absolutely. How do you plan to address that gap in order to make sure mental health services are available to all DC residents that need them? Well, first of all, I'm very proud of the work that we have done uh, over the course of many years, probably more than 15 years, in making sure all D.C. residents, uh, most D.C. residents, 90, I think 8 percent of people have access to health insurance, and we should all be proud of that. Uh, in fact, what we have done uh, is we have expanded uh, that so that even our alliance um, program is easier for people to access, and we were able to get that accomplished uh, in this budget. Uh, I convened a health care systems transformation committee, and one of their recommendations was that we create sobering centers in the district, uh, which we will launch. We think that we, we need two, one in one Ward 1 uh, and one in Ward 6, to help with our DBH services, especially uh, for people who are experiencing homelessness, that we can get them into a safe place where they can stabilize uh, and get connected to treatment. For our young, okay. We'll come back to it in, okay. in the open discussion. Council Member Trayon White. What I fully understand is that hurt people hurt people, but I also understand that heal people heal people. Growing up in extreme trauma, we have not done enough as a district to address the mental health and trauma in our communities. Me personally, every Wednesday morning at 8 o'clock a.m. this morning, I sit in front of my therapist on Zoom now, but to address the trauma that I've experienced as a young black man burying 250 individuals right here in my community. And so we have to first re-educate people about the services they need, and we have to get our government to respond. I have to call Deputy Mayor Gildot when I go to a crime scene and kids out there, out there and there's been a mass shooting in the neighborhood, saying, where are the first responders? We say these things, we have these people in the budget, but when I'm there, the government is not there. The police is there, the detectives are there, and the community is there, but the behavior, health, uh, responsibility that's supposed to be in the community is absent. So as mayor, I will make sure they are responsive and address the family and issues every day, in school, out of school, and in our communities. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Robert White, do you have a minute? Uh, I, I, I frequently say that there are two kind of people. There are people who have mental health uh, concerns who know they have mental health concerns and people who have mental health concerns who don't know they have mental health concerns. But it's something that we all have to be paying attention to. If there is a silver lining in the pandemic, it is the increased attention to the need for mental health services. That is why I've been working with the University of the District of Columbia to create a pipeline of mental health professionals because right now we don't have enough professionals to meet the need. I'm creating a scholarship so that any district resident who has a bachelor's degree can get their master's in counseling or masters in social work for free. After we establish that with the University of the District of Columbia, I want to spread it to the other universities across our city, and then I want to push it down to high school so that our people from our community can get bachelor's and master's degrees in mental health uh, work and serve the cities that they live in. Thank you. We'll open it up now for, for discussion. Mayor? Sorry. I'm sorry. Mayor, uh, did you want to I, I will just add, thought? I think that the, the council members and I uh, agree uh, that the, we need to continue to focus on getting trauma-informed services in our communities. Uh, we had a, a program where we created 10 family support services centers in wards 5, 7, and 8, and they're in communities, and they are staffed by people from the community where we can bring our services of the government closer uh, to where people need them. Uh, our Office of Victim Services and Justice Grants similarly uh, provides grant funding to community serving agencies that are providing that, that trauma care. Are either of the council members like to? Yeah, the, the, the only thing I, I would add, and, and, and I agree with the mayor, but the only thing I would add is that there is an acute mental health need in our schools that we have to address urgently. There is an acute mental health need in our uh, in homeless encampments that we have to address urgently. And like other jurisdictions, we have got to be serious about helping these students and helping our unhoused residents in a way that doesn't further traumatize people who already have mental health issues. Okay. All right, Fitz, you want to take the next question? All right, we're going to move on. We're going to stay in the health care realm here. Uh, Councilmember Tran White, DC Policy Center did a study 
And it found, not surprisingly, the need for health care in Latino communities and black communities is much higher than it is in white communities. It's one thing to identify a problem, though. It's another thing to come up with a plan to fix the problem. It shows a large gap in that demand right now. What is your plan to address this gap and get health care to the people who most need it? And as we've seen in the pandemic right now, those gaps are wide. Well, my plan is already in motion. Um, for, I can talk about what I'm going to do, but I want to talk about what I have done and how we're going to expand those same uh, type of plans and leadership across the district. Uh, when we didn't have a hospital in Ward 8, I worked with the uh, Bowser administration and also Council Member Gray to ensure we can have a state-of-the-art hospital east of Anacostia River. Uh, it's not just about a hospital, it's about building a health care system. We also opened in two urgent care facilities east of Anacostia River. So it's about finding partners and those who, I have a Ward 8 Health Council who advises me uh, on what to do to address health care in the community. Now listen, part of being a leader is listening, and not just listening, but taking action. So from that, lead, from that council, we advise several plans to implement uh, strategies to uh, have scattered sites for health care systems that work for everyday people, including uh, a hospital and two urgent care facilities right here in Ward 8. And that's the type of leadership we need across the district to ensure that equity and health care is a priority in this administration. Mayor, you want to take a minute on this? Uh, absolutely. And uh, you, you are right that uh, a, a light was shown on our health care disparities, but they existed before. Uh, and some of the differences between the black experience and the white experience has to do with generational stress, anxiety, and racism. Uh, and so we have to acknowledge that, but also pour into how we can do what we can do in the right now to close those gaps. Um, so what council member acknowledges the work that that my administration did uh, to finally bring a state-of-the-art hospital uh, east of the river uh, and to make sure that the district got out of the business of running it so we have a partnership with an academic partner uh, in their health plan that has a reputation that people will uh, will be able to trust and go to that hospital so we've been able to do that including creating the urgent care centers but also bringing food and fresh food uh, to communities Communities. When I first ran in Ward 8, people said we have to create more um, grocery stores. And so our plan and our model was to pour into local businesses that have been successful uh, in the city and help them be their partner in opening uh, in Ward 8 and Ward 7. And so we'll have three new opportunities. And we know healthy food uh, helps with healthy people. Councilmember Robert White. Um, so when I, I talk to residents in, in Ward 7 and 8, they consistently tell me that they feel left behind, that they feel forgotten. And one of the things that they point to is the lack of medical services. Uh, I do applaud the mayor for her work and Council Member Gray's work uh, on bringing a hospital to, to Ward 8. I think we also know that we need more than just the hospital. We need a medical system. That includes urgent cares. That includes community-based medical centers. But I think we also have to make sure that we are incentivizing local practices, uh, both our doctors, physicians, uh, pediatricians, but also mental health professionals to locate their practices east of the Anacostia River so that residents uh, in Ward 7 and 8 don't have to travel across the city. The other thing we have to do, and technology allows us to do this, is continue to push the limits on telehealth so that people have more access to seeing their doctors without having to travel. Well, I'll open, open discussion here. Obviously, we've gone through two years of this pandemic now, so what have you learned? What have you learned about how our health care system works and doesn't work? And what would you do if elected to change that? Uh, one of the things that concern me is our shift in health care providers. We changed the contract at least two times in the last four years. Uh, I met with a group of doctors, health care professionals, saying they are having a hard time billing and getting the money they need to uh, take care of the patients who are in dire need, and most of those are east of Anacostia River. And so we have to streamline uh, services uh, through healthcare finance agency, uh, and we have to make sure that when we are leading uh, our, our, our city, that we have to take an account and listen to those who are providing and doing the work because we don't know everything as leaders. And that's important that we surround ourselves with people who know what's going on to ensure they can do their job so we can do our job more efficiently. And in this administration, we struggled doing that during a pandemic, changing healthcare providers twice. Councilmember White? 
Uh, the, the pandemic has, has highlighted health inequities that we have already known about. Uh, when you look at the entire region, uh, the place, the neighborhood with the highest life expectancy and the neighborhood with the lowest life expectancy are both in the District of Columbia, separated by only about three miles. This is because this is because there are issues with access uh, to, to medical services, which we spoke about a minute ago. But we also understand the impact that housing instability has on people's health, that the lack of access to fresh food has on people's health, that the stress of poverty concentrated in certain parts of our city has on people's health. So when we talk about health inequities and how we solve them, we have to know that we can't just solve them with hospitals and clinics. We have to solve them by going to the root of these problems and fixing those. Mayor? So you, you asked one, one of the biggest things we learned about our health care system, and we knew it, um, but we, we are very focused on solutions, and that is the shortage of nurses uh, in our health care system. And in an, an emergency, uh, what that means? Um, what that means is you had nurses leaving their own families, uh, working before vaccinations, working after vaccinations, and a lot of them now leaving the profession uh, because because of what they experienced in COVID. Uh, so we are focused on working with all of our healthcare providers about how we can support an increased pipeline of nurses. We created a scholarship called DC's Futures where we're working with UDC and Trinity and Catholic uh, to make sure that we are supporting our residents to get into those good paying jobs. And more than that, when uh, I talked earlier about um, breaking ground on a new hospital in Ward 8 that's going to open in 2024, it was a part of a larger agreement. And the second part of that agreement will get us a brand new hospital at Howard University on Georgia Avenue and centers of excellence, that's excellence at Howard that the district will support. And we're going to move on to another segment, Jeanette. All right. Fitz, thank you. Uh, we said we wanted to do things a little differently for the debate. This wraps up the first portion of the debate. Uh, candidates will have to be a little more concise in their answers for this next segment. We want to move on to our quick response questions. Only one candidate will be asked each question with 30 seconds for the moderator to ask the question and 30 seconds for a response. I will start with Council Member Robert White. For years, safety issues have plagued Metro. Most recently, 60% of Metro's fleet was pulled from service after a derailment. The agency's general manager and COO resigned after half of Metro's train operator operators failed to finish a recertification process. Who should be held accountable for these safety issues, and how do you restore trust in an agency that many believe is no longer responsible, or reliable, rather? You have 30 seconds to respond. Uh, the management at Metro have to be uh, held responsible. This is an agency uh, with historic maintenance backlogs, but we have to get on top of them. We have to have a plan. The District of Columbia has to play an outsized role in directing this because the Metro is the center for our city, but it is not the center for Maryland and Virginia. So we have to play the leadership role. We have to make sure that the board is full of people who are transportation and engineering experts who are there to find and solve the problems. That is the only way, but we We've got to get people riding Metro again. That means it needs to be reliable. All right, those are your 30 seconds. Uh, Mo. Mayor Bowser, you launched the Vision Zero initiative back in 2015 with a goal of achieving zero fatalities on DC roads by 2024. According to government data, traffic fatalities have actually gone up each of the last three years from 27 in 2019 to 40 in 2021. So in 30 seconds. Sure. Do you still think you can hit that goal? And if so, how? We are still going to work hard to hit that goal, Mo. And, and what we know nationally, uh, we have seen traffic fatalities grow up. Uh, we have seen um, speeding and reckless driving increase, and we have seen more people living on the edge. Uh, and so our job is to use our budget, and the budget that uh, was just approved by the council includes $200 million that will allow us to fix every uh, dangerous intersection and corridor identified by DDOT. It will also allow us to put more people, crossing guards, in, in, in traffic TCOs, we call them traffic control officers, uh, and more crossing guards um, for more hours. We know all of those things will make our streets safer. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Trayon White, uh, you proposed a ticket forgiveness 
program in D.C. for D.C.'s ticketing program. You've called it predatory, but this comes at the same time we've seen pedestrian cyclist deaths, the highest since 2008. So should dangerous drivers be given a break on these tickets, even though we're seeing these alarming numbers of deaths of people being hit by these speeding cars? It's strange how you categorize that. Absolutely not. What we are saying is that D.C. has one of the third highest ticket rates in the country, and it's predatory. Anytime we see D.C. government workers driving around 2 o'clock in the morning, it's not about public safety. It's about revenue. We see speed cameras. Do you know that in D.C., under the law, you can get a $500 and a $1,000 ticket in Washington, D.C. today? And we got plenty of ways to recuperate on that investment. Let me tell you how. When you get a ticket, you got to pay that. When you get a boot, you have to pay that. When you get told, you have to pay that. When you go when you go to the lot, you have to pay that on Saturday and Sunday, even when they're closed. If you don't pay that, they're going to take it out of your taxes. And they're going to sell your car and make money off your car, and you still have to pay. Council Member Robert White, there's a possibility NFL football could return to the district. Give me a second, you all. Given the current investigation surrounding Commander's owner Dan Snyder, would you be comfortable moving forward with a project to bring a stadium to D.C.? You have 30 seconds. Uh, re regardless of the issues with Dan Snyder, I wouldn't be comfortable bringing the stadium to D.C. Here's why. Most of us would love a football stadium, but what we need is housing. We're watching massive displacement, particularly of people of color, uh, move from our city. And some people will say, well, we can have housing in a stadium. Well, a stadium necessarily takes land that could be used for housing. And if anybody believes that housing is going to be affordable next to a professional football stadium, uh, they are fooling themselves. So our priorities must be green space, retail that's going to create jobs year-round, and affordable housing. All right. We're getting close to the end here. And so I'm going to ask the final question of the debate for all three of you. And you each have 90 seconds to answer it. Excuse me. You each, you each have 30 seconds to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> what is one decision? Each of you have been in your current jobs for a little while now. What is one decision you've made in your current job that you regret, and what would you do differently? And I'm just going to go down the line, starting with you, Council Member Trayon White. This job is a job that I could not prepare for, even though I come under the leadership of Mayor for Life, Marion Bird. Um, for me, uh, I'm very off the hip, and sometimes that has caused me uh, tremendously. And as, as growing into a senior council member, I learned to be more thoughtful. Uh, innovative and more uh, have a leadership role in what I want to see done in my community by incorporating people into the equation. So that's been a learning journey for me, and I'm glad Thank that you. I made a mistake and learned from it. Thank you, Council Member. <laughs> Mayor Bowser. Um, I have a political regret, and uh, that regret is. Uh, I, my parents always taught me to stand up for myself and defend myself and to make sure people respect me. Uh, and that led me to oppose a sitting council member in her reelection. Uh, and I don't regret standing up and speaking up and defending myself in my administration, but I do regret that it got personal. Uh, and so that is a, reg a regret that I have. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Robert White. Um, look, the, the there are plenty of things that, that I regret. I'm learning every day. Uh, and what I try to do is make sure that I don't focus on the things that I could have, would have, should have done differently, but I use every opportunity as an opportunity to learn. What I've seen from that is an increasing strength in my council office that have become one of the strongest offices in the building. That is our time. Uh, that concludes our questions for tonight. That concludes our questions for tonight. We want to thank Mayor Muriel Bowser, the council members, of course, for joining us.